It gives society part three, session one. In all countries, men's efforts are producing great wealth, but are only in receiving a fraction of it. This imbalance is expressed from time to time in workers' unrest, protests, and in extreme cases, civil unrest, until the true cause or causes of this imbalance are determined. These struggles and all cries will be pain. Until reason is employed, the ignorance that abounds will continue to imprison working men in the condition that they find themselves in. Our aim this term is to ascertain with clarity whether protection or free trade conduces to the best interests of workers, those who live by their labor, whether protection or free trade will result in the interest or reduction in wages, and consequently in a rise or fall in the standard of living. Those who live by their labor ought to will enhance their return. Whatever improves the condition of the lowest and broadest social structure where the working class is located must promote the true interests of all. Where the wages of workers are high and employment is easier to obtain, prosperity will abound. These conditions, entrepreneurship and innovation will thrive. Living standards will be high. There will be the widest diffusion of knowledge, the purest morals, and the truest patriotism displayed. With high wages, we will have a healthy, happy, enlightened, and virtuous people. Government would be honest, firmly based on popular will, and would strive to keep wages in which is high rather than try to limit it as is the case currently. We will inquire into whether protective tariffs are really conducive to the ends which men seek. We will first go over the issues upon which protective tariffs are advocated and defended. We will look at what effect the opposite policy of free trade will have and will, be, will as far as possible be unbiased as to the conclusion. We will try to determine whether protection increases or decreases national wealth, whether it does or does not benefit the worker. This subject has been very controversial from time immemorial, has been widely and energetically advocated without any widely accepted conclusion. This may be because the pecuniary interests to advocate protectionist policies have the loudest voices, drowning out the free traders who do not advocate with clarity. There is, however, great suspicion of the protectionist lobby. Adam Smith, the father of economics, demonstrated that protective that tariffs hamper the production of wealth. He, however, it is said, did not carry his inquiry far enough into the true causes. If he did, then this great debate may have ended a long time ago. Advocates of protection extol its virtues by saying that employment is protected. They assert that protection maintains wages without explaining, as we did last term, what determines the, the level of wages. In the first place, much of the current discussion on the tariff question has no validity but serves the purpose of controversy, not aiding in the discovery of truth. That a thing exists with or follows another thing is no proof that it is because of that other thing. For example, in the 19th century, wages in the United States were higher than in the United Kingdom and the protective tariffs existing on the U.S. were more than in the U.K. The assumption that one fact is because of the other is no more valid than higher wages are due to the type of government. 19th century, the wealth of the United Kingdom grew because of the abolition of protection, protectionist tariffs. This too, the assumption cannot be deduced from this. It does not follow that an institution
function is good because a country has prospered under it, nor bad because a country in which it exists is not prosperous. Protectionist sentiments have certainly the weight of the most general acceptance. The presumption in favor of any belief generally entertained has existed in favor of many beliefs now known to be entirely erroneous, especially when such beliefs are promoted by powerful special interests. These interests do, not do constitute a power that is most potent in forming public opinion and influencing legislation. Persons who are of the protectionist opinion may have been convinced as a result of this public opinion and not as a result of a rigorous examination of the question. Protection has always had an effective ally in national prejudices and hatreds. Workers generally feel that they do not get a fair return for their labor. What prevents them from higher wages is the competition with others for work, and they are generally sympathetic to the view that any further protection from other economies will keep their wages tight. The advocates of protection say that this is their main aim. The trade argument has to include the restriction on the production of wealth caused by land enclosure. Free trade not only means trading freely with other economies, it also means trading freely within the economy. If free trade was truly in place, then labor would not have to be protected. If land was freely available, then wages would be high enough and cost of production would be low enough to compete favorably with goods and services wanting to enter the local econ economy. Trade, it has been said, is responsible for the poverty of the laboring classes and fosters a callous indifference to their sufferings. Free traders, however, have missed the mark regarding the restriction that land enclosure has had on the production and distribution of wealth. This is where the examination and the argument must go if we are to find the real answers. To, ad to admit that labor needs protection is to acknowledge its inferiority. It is to agree with a position that degrades workers to a position of dependency and the claim that the employee is bound to vote in the interests of the employer who provides him with work. So we stop here now and we look at this new book. Well known, Protection of Free Trade by Henry George, which is an examination of the tariff question with a special regard to the interests of labor. So trade is as natural as speech. So it is surprising that trade barriers lead to stifling regulation, law evasion, inflation, depression, and even war. Henry George goes beyond deceptive slogans and recurring controversies to show how the holders of land and other privileges are the ultimate beneficiaries of trade protection. And this work was originally published in 1886. So get your copy of this book here at the address, the Amazon address uh, listed here. Um, it's a good read, and it's well worth your money and time. Protectionism rules on the assumption that pauperism is the natural condition of the working class, and this class must be protected, or else things will be much worse. Why should labor need protection? Is it not the creator of capital, the producer of wealth? Does not the labor that men provide feed and clothes and shelter others? Why then must labor be protected if it provides everything 
that all men use in, the, in this world. When we consider that labor is the producer of all wealth, is it not a dichotomy that the producers of wealth find themselves in conditions of impoverishment and dependence? What labor should then demand is not protection, but real freedom to produce and consume themselves. Protectionism is a national policy which calls for the levying of duties upon imported commodities for the purpose of protecting from competition the local economy's production. Protectionism is geared to securing the highest property of a nation by producing for itself everything it is capable of. That to this end, the local economy should be protected using tariffs on goods produced in foreign countries where wages are lower. Protectionism asserts that each country must stand jealously on guard against every other country and direct artificial obstacles to national intercourse. It implies a federation of citizens within a country where free trade is good but disastrous if this same free trade exists with men in different countries. There's a quotation from Henry George which epitomizes what protectionism, protectionism is about. Religion and experience alike teach us that the highest good of each is to be sought in the good of others. Two interests of men are harmonious, not antagonistic, that prosperity is the daughter of goodwill and peace, and that want and destruction follow enmity and strife. The protective theory, on the other hand, implies the opposition of natural, national interests. The gain of one people is the loss of others, that each must seek his own good by constant efforts to get advantage over others and to prevent others from getting advantage over it. It makes of nations rivals instead of cooperators. It inculcates a warfare of restrictions and prohibitions and searchings and seizures, which differs in weapon but not in spirit, from, the, from that warfare which sinks ships and burns cities. Can we imagine the nation beating their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks? And yet, men protection or free trade. Many of us believe that evading protective tariffs, tariffs is, a wrong, is a moral wrong. Or many of us really believe that tariffs are necessary for the well-being and progress of Let us consider how sharply protectionism conflicts with our common experience. The site is recommended for a proposed city, for a proposed city, because it is difficult to get to. Would that be our common experience? According to protective theory, this would be an ideal situation. We all applaud and agree with the modern improvements in society regarding transportation over land and sea, the opening of new canals, the expansion of rail travel, the improvement in harbors and containers, ships. We all agree that they are, they are, these are all beneficial. But how can tariffs then be beneficial? Effects of improvements are to lessen the cost of transporting goods. The effect of tariffs is to increase it. If protectionism is ideal, then these improvements on cost efficiencies are injurious to mankind unless tariffs become seriously increased. What do we make of this? We can take the argument further by saying that all labor-saving inventions and discoveries would be antagonistic to protectionism. Tariffs are imposed for the general, for the specific purpose of keeping out cheap goods from entering. Yet machines and processes are daily invented that produce goods cheaper 
than the cheapest foreign labor. For it to be consistent, should not only prohibit imports, but should, should also prohibit the production of labor saving devices, labor saving systems. What do we think? Clearly, if protectionism, protectionism is the ideal between country and country, it should also be the ideal between each state, each country, each township. There should also be tariff regimes between these entities. What do we think? If nations should not buy from other nations what they might themselves produce, then the same principle should apply to the family. Families should be forbidden to purchase anything that it might produce. Social laws, like physical laws, must apply to the molecule as well as to the aggregate. But a social condition in which this principle is fully carried out would be deemed to be utter, utterly unacceptable. What do we think? Next week, we will continue our discussion on trade. Before we end, I would like again to let you attendees know that Unsustainable Development is an educational offering devoted to the dissemination of its course to all of mankind and to those who have the English language as their official language in the first instance and to all eventually all over the world. If it's possible, and because we do not charge a fee for this dissemination, we rely wholeheartedly on monetary donations to meet the cost of achieving these goals. You have found these sessions useful thus far, and would like us to have access to them. We would gratefully accept your donation, should you be inclined to offer them. You can send donations to our PayPal account at the email address roadbroker2001 at yahoo.com. Thank you for your kind gesture. As indicated before, you can communicate with us by going to our Facebook page, Unsustainable Development, or our YouTube channel, Balancing the Economy. We will respond to all your comments or questions. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the alert button to get notices that our latest session has been posted. All sessions are archived at our Facebook page. Please share with your family, friends, and acquaintances. 